its rise in a theology of God's perfection. A perfection which is to be construed not abstractly, but in terms of the imminent relations of the persons of the Trinity. Second, God's perfection is not simply self-revolving. No, it's the uncreated abundance of grace, so that to God's entire blessedness in himself, there corresponds his own freedom. Uh, there corresponds to his own freedom the blessing of creatures with life and new life. The dogmatics of divine perfection, along with its corollary metaphysics, therefore, is wholly other than, is nothing other than a conceptual expansion of that statement in the Johannine Prologue, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. God's fullness, his perfection, is manifest as the whence of present grace. In his perfection, God is, as Calvin comments, the fountain of life, a truly inexhaustible fountain. Well, as we reflect together on, uh, on these topics this afternoon, we'd be led, I think, to say rather more about the doctrine of the imminent trinity than is customary amongst the majority of contemporary theologians. As we push ahead in this direction, we'll come to see, I hope, that teaching about God's imminent life can't be shrugged off as a kind of speculative occlusion of the benefits with which the gospel concerns itself. God's imminent life is of evangelical import. The mystery of God's own triune life is that from which alone we can illuminate the economy of salvation, which at the Father's behest is brought to us by the Word made flesh and the Spirit shed abroad. God's redemptive presence and activity come to lost creatures out of the infinite profundity of God's imminent life. Now, the temptation, of course, is to hurry past this as to some denser, soteriologically more immediate truth. But the temptation has to be resisted if we're to grasp the gratuity of the divine act now by showing the depth at which the world's bond to God is rooted within God himself. So I want to proceed, first of all, by an initial orientation to the notion of God's perfection. That's followed, second, by a description of God's perfection as his life uh, from himself in the inner divine relations. And third, by discussion of God's external relations, where we'll consider what are usually called the missions of the triune persons and the covenant of salvation between father and son which undergird God's economic action. Um, I should say by way of a kind of health warning, I suppose, at this stage, that there is, uh, as far as I'm aware, no way of shortcutting a certain amount of hard conceptual labour involved in pursuing this approach, um, to say the least. Uh, as we set out on that, we might encourage ourselves with a couple of maxims from the doctors of the faith. Uh, the first is from Augustine, who says, Nowhere is seeking more toilsome or finding more fruitful than where the Trinity is concerned. And the second is from St. Thomas, who in the course of his stunning treatment of Trinitarian dogma, tells us this. To know the divine persons was necessary for us so that we may have the right views of the salvation of mankind accomplished by the Son who became flesh and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, suitably fortified by the wisdom of our forebears, we shall proceed. First of all, in God's perfection. God's perfection is the fullness with which he is and acts as the one he is. Perfection, if you want, is a positive or material concept. It does not first and foremost denote negative states of affairs, the absence of restriction or potentiality in God's being, Rather, perfection indicates God's wholly realised identity as himself. Things are called perfect when they have achieved actuality, Aquinas says. The perfect being, the, sorry, the perfect being that in which nothing required by the thing's particular mode of perfection fails to exist. Now that's crucial. A dogmatic understanding of God's perfection is going to be concerned to specify the particular mode of perfection which is proper to God. Here, 
the business of dogmatics is not disputation, but simple explication. That is, simply a repetition and expansion of the divine self-naming and self-indication. I am he, God says in Isaiah. A Christian theology of God's perfection, therefore, asks a very simple question, who is this God? Well, because the concept of perfection is, in theological usage, an indicator of God's identity, therefore, it's not something that we are to fill out comparatively. What do I mean by that? Well, a, a theologically determinate understanding of God's perfection can't be achieved simply by working upwards, by, for example, denying of God certain deficiencies in creatures or magnifying in God what are taken to be properties of greatness. The perfection of the one who announces, I am he, I am who I am, is not something we reach by, first of all, determining the nature of a perfect being, that is, a being who maximally instantiates great-making properties. Now, of course, accounts by philosophers of religion along these lines have acquired a certain prestige in the last 20 years or so, and at first blush, they seem to have strong continuities with classical Christian theology. But for my money, at least, they're flawed by what I think are at least two weaknesses. One is that the notion of God as a maximally perfect being is pervaded by an abstract notion of deity. That is, a notion of divinity which isn't generated or corrected by God's self-enactment, but tends to emerge out of, for example, the need for the concept of a perfect God as a causal explanation of the world. That is, God's perfection becomes a necessary property of the world's origin. A second weakness is that, unlike the pre-modern Christian thinkers to whom perfect being philosophers often appeal, often appealing, of course, to Anselm, the doctrine of the Trinity in this philosophical work plays very little role. The weight of the edifice is essentially borne by a concept of deity and the logical structure of that concept. God's special character, what Aquinas calls the particular mode of perfection, which is confessed of God as Father, Son and Spirit, the one who has life in himself and gives life to creatures, that particular mode of perfection tends in perfect being philosophy to be subsumed beneath determining the necessary attributes of the supreme cosmological causal power. Now the result is a notion of God which is synthetic rather than analytic. That is, it's generated from observations upon creaturely realities and their lack, and so in the end, it's actually an insufficiently determinate concept of divine perfection. God's perfection, I want to suggest by contrast, is his singular, non-comparative and non-derivative identity. It's tautology, God is God, rather than comparison or contrast, which is basic to the dogmatic logic of the doctrine of God. Because that doctrine, at least in its Christian exposition, is concerned with the sheer originality and singularity of the one who makes his perfection known by his presence in the history of the covenant, and supremely, of course, in the word incarnate and the outpoured spirit. So at this point, therefore, dogmatics has once again to acknowledge that it stands in a very direct way beneath the governance of revelation. <coughs> revelation, as I tried to indicate last night, is best thought of as God's communicative presence. And that presence disciplines us. That is, it commands us to direct our attention to the place where God's majestic condescension is to be found in the works of God. But crucially, to attend to Revelation can't mean stopping short at God's works. It must mean attending to those works in their depth, seeing them not only in their temporal presence, but also in their reference back to the groundless, infinite reality of God's own life. For Revelation, in the economy of God's works, 
is a making known of the mystery of God's will, Ephesians tell us. God's purpose to unite all things in Christ. And precisely as such, Revelation grounds the history of God's works, that which he set forth in Christ, it grounds that in the deeper reality of God's will, purpose and plan. His eternal and antecedent determination, which for Ephesians is a mystery, that is something which exceeds our comprehension even as it presents itself to us. Revelation is not God's transparency or availability. It is God specifying his being before us. Even therefore, in his revelatory presence, God remains God, the inapprehensible, perfect one. Whatever else may be meant by Emmanuel, it can't mean less than this. Now all that then is to say that we require a material understanding of God's perfection. One which is directed at every point by what the Gospel tells us about God's self-expressive form, that is, God's being with us in his works. As we set out the components of such an understanding, we're not really inquiring into what has to be predicated of a perfect God. Rather, we're trying to discern what the form or shape of God's works manifests about the being of the one who is at work. But before proceeding any further, we ought to think, just to back up and ask ourselves a question. Um, do we really need to insist on this dogmatic move? I shouldn't say we, because you're not insisting on it, I'm insisting on it. <laughs> do I really need to insist on this dogmatic move? Doesn't the desire to make that move <coughs> threaten once again to lead Christian doctrine back into captivity to those metaphysical assumptions about the separation of the permanence of being and the transitoriness of appearance. And doesn't this separation insinuate itself into the Christian doctrine of God whenever God's imminent life is conceived to be the eternal, immutable substrate of his historical manifestation? Doesn't the very language I've been using, ground or depth or outer form and inner being, and the pervasive distinction between cr uncreated and created being, doesn't all that represent a kind of resistance to the gospel's instruction to look for the gospel's God here in temporal appearance? Are we really taking with full seriousness the constitutive significance of God's works for God's being? Perhaps many contemporary theologians would say historical appearance is of itself sufficient. Perhaps it doesn't need depth or ground. Perhaps the economy of God's presence is the entirety of God's perfection. This is Robert Jensen, God's hypostatic being. His self-identity is constituted in dramatic coherence, he says. And he goes on, Aristotle regarded liability to historical contingency as an ontological deficit. But since God himself is identified by contingencies, Aristotle's prejudice need not hinder us. Why should commitment in a history not be instead an ontological perfection? Well, is what we're doing, what I'm doing, simply an instance of what Jensen calls Aristotle's prejudice? Um, he certainly thinks so. What do we make of this? Well, this isn't an objection which can be knocked out at a single blow. The cogency of the objection, um, as well as the cogency of any proposed alternative, depends, I think, upon a capacity to generate an illuminating reading of the canon and, derivatively, of the mainstream Christian tradition. But by way, at least, of an anticipatory gesture, two things might be said. First, to speak of God's life in himself as the depth of God's works is not, I believe, to demote those works to the status of mere epiphenomena. Only a seriously reduced dogmatics would do that. A dogmatics, for instance, in which the only relations in God would be relations of origin, in which the divine missions were accorded no significance in determining the properties of the, divine, of the triune persons, in which the eternal divine counsel 
had been scoured clean of any reference to the choice and appointment of creatures to fellowship with God. And no really serious Christian dogmatics worth its salt is going to make those moves. Second, the drama of the economy has not only events, as Jensen wants to say, it also has dramatis personae, it has the persons of the drama. And a doctrine of the perfect life of the imminent trinity furnishes precisely a description of those persons and agents in the drama. It doesn't reduce the drama to mere appearance. It doesn't say that the agents in the drama are simply masks. Rather, it tries to indicate that the evangelical saving force of the drama takes its momentum from these agents and their acts of sending and coming, from missions and their temporal enactment in which the eternal God reaches out to creatures and blesses them. So God's perfection is the fullness of life which God is in himself. It is his abundance of life. We can make our approach, I think, to a dogmatic presentation of the concept of God's perfection um, in a slightly um, circuitous way through one of its extensions, uh, which is the concept of God's aseity. Well, what do we mean by aseity? Formally, of course, defined, aseity means simply God's self-existence, his being from himself. Um, a slightly better formulation, um, common in the early Reformed tradition, is that God is out of theos. Um, it's a better concept, I think, because it's not caught in the idiom of self-derivation, which tends to dog the, uh, the history of the concept of aseity. Um, Herman Bavinck offers um, what we can uh, see as a standard definition of aseity. He says this, this is volume two of the uh, dogmatics. By this perfection, God is alone essentially and absolutely distinct from all creatures. God is exclusively from himself, not in the sense of being self-caused, but being from eternity to eternity who he is, being not becoming. God is absolute being, the fullness of being, and therefore also eternally and absolutely independent in his existence, in his perfection, in all his work, the first and the last, the sole cause and final good of all things. So, as one who is from himself, our say, God subsists in himself. Of God alone can it be said that he is unoriginate, uncreated. His excellence has no derivation, but it is self-grounded and therefore absolute. In effect, the notion of aseity is a kind of conceptual rendering of Exodus 3.14. Uh, indeed, that text um, echoes throughout the history of the term. Um, this is a passage, for instance, from, uh, from Anselm's Prothlogion, where he's me meditating on the Exodus text. You above all, you, you above all then, Lord, are what you are, and you are who you are. What began to exist from non-existence, and can be thought not to exist, and returns to non-existence unless it subsists through some other, and what has had a past existence but does not now exist, and a future existence but does not yet exist, such a thing does not exist in a strict and absolute sense, but you are what you are, for whatever you are at any time or in any way, this you are holy and forever. Now what Anselm's doing there, I think, is reaching towards, with a notion of aseity, the irreducibly unique and incommensurable nature of God's being. That being said, I think there are some kind of residual problems with the notion of aseity that we need to uh, at least keep our eye on um, unless the concept is kept within fairly close confines, it can become a bit unravelled. First of all, a saint needs to be distinguished quite carefully from the notion of God as causa sui, as, uh, as his own cause, cause of himself, which has sometimes surfaced in the Christian tradition. There is, of course, um, a logical oddity about the notion of God being his own cause, because it appears to suggest that God in some way precedes himself as his own cause, um, which, to say the least, is uh, very strange. But there are also, I think, some dogmatic difficulties. 
First of all, to say that God is his own cause is to introduce into the concept of God a measure of actualism in which God comes to be as the result of some causal process. And this, of course, can undermine any talk of God's eternity or unchangeableness. Moreover, the distinction which the notion of God as his own cause requires, the distinction between cause on the one hand and that which is caused on the other, that obviously imperils God's simplicity and so undermines the classical identity of essence and existence in God. In effect, what happens with the notion of God as self-caused is that we introduce the idea of production into the being of God so that God's non-existence becomes a kind of background condition to God's being. And as a result, God lacks an integral element of perfection. So God from himself cannot mean that God is his own maker. There are obviously um, knock-on effects of this for recent debates, for instance, about whether God constitutes himself as Trinity by um, electing uh, to be in certain relations to creatures. Um, but that's not anywhere I want to go. I'm kind of prepared to make um, quiet statements about it um, on other occasions, possibly. <laughs> Second, some further problems, I think, can arise when aseity is expounded contrastively so that divine self-existence is set against created contingency. Unless handled carefully, the result is that aseity becomes a kind of reverse concept. This takes place, I'm sure you'll see, when the concept of aseity is derived not so much by considering the material reality of God's self-expressive being, but rather derived from a consideration of the nature of contingent reality. Namely, contingent reality can only satisfactorily be explained by positing a self-grounded, divine ground of all other being. The danger there is that the shape of aseity is defined by the metaphysics of created reality. And when that happens, it shares the fate of other concepts in the doctrine of God, like God as necessary being. Namely, it becomes attached to the project of explaining the world, and so it derives teaching about God from God's cosmological functions. Third, the notion of aseity needs to be carefully distinguished from the rather blank notion of independence with which it's often been associated in the, uh, in the tradition. If this is allowed to happen, then a subordinate negative characteristic of aseity, um, absence of origination or absence of dependence upon external cause, that negative character expands in such a way that it fills the whole notion and so it ends up eclipsing the primary positive meaning of aseity which is God's eternal fullness of life. And used in that way, independence can quickly acquire a momentum of its own. Its shape gets filled out from all manner of other sources, and thereby God comes to be subsumed within the general category of the unconditioned. Well, those are difficulties with the notion. Properly handled, of course, the notion of God's aseity is a serviceable corollary of the concept of God's perfection, particularly, I think, in articulating the freedom of God. The disruptive potential within the notion of aseity can, I think, only be held in check <coughs> by ensuring, first of all, that material description is primary, second, that contrasts between God and creatures don't determine the content of what's said about God, and third, that teaching about God isn't dominated by God's functions vis-a-vis -vis creatures, but by the divine self-enactment and what that enactment manifests of God's own life. We can't fashion an account of the perfection of God out of his underivedness. We have to offer a positive transcription of his abundant life, his incomparable aliveness as the one who declares himself to be who he is. And it's the doctrine of the Trinity which is precisely that kind of positive transcription. Trinitarian teaching promotes, provides a fully material and determinate Christian concept of God's perfection. God is one as Father, Son and Spirit. 
the relations between the triune persons constitute God's undivided perfection. They don't flow from it as secondary realities underpinned by a kind of simple divine substrate. No, they are the one God. God's perfection, therefore, is his abundant life in himself as the Father, the unoriginate one who is eternally the Father of the Son and the one from whom the Spirit proceeds. God is himself as the Son who is generate of the Father and who with the Father breathes the Spirit. And God is himself as the Spirit who proceeds from them both. God's perfection is this life of his. Much more than absence and derivation, God's perfection is this plenitude of relations, this wholly realised communion, which is the particular mode uh, in which the particular mode of God's perfection consists. In this sense, we can say, I think, as, as the great 19th century dogmatician whom nobody ever reads these days, Isaac Dorner, said this, God is the perennial and eternal cause of his own absolute reality, boundlessly alive, wholly spontaneous, replete, glorious and resplendent. Now what theology can say about this imminent perfection of God's life is necessarily indirect. The processions of Son and Spirit from the Eternal Father can be apprehended only as implications of what is set before us in the economy. But, and this is a, a crucial point, this indirectness shouldn't be taken to mean that the only significant Trinitarian distinctions are those which are enacted in the external works of God. God's triunity is not simply his threefold historical actuality. What we encounter in the economy of God's works is not a history into which God has, as it were, emptied himself. It is a history which is brought about by divine movements from outside creation, movements in which God reaches down or out towards or into creaturely time. In this history, the Son is in the world only, we read in John, because I proceeded and came forth from God. The Spirit is with the disciples and dwells with them and is in them only because the Spirit is given. And proceeding, coming forth, being given, all point back. And following this line of retrojection, we can come to see that their presence in the world and their differentiations are external enactments of eternal movements and distinctions within the being of God. Well, that being so, uh, and I hope it is so, because the rest of the argument for the rest of the lectures depends on it, we may, fittingly, non-speculatively, move to indicate something of the particular inner life of the one in three. As Father, Son and Spirit, the one who names himself as such by manifesting himself and acting towards creatures, God's life is constituted by what are called the personal works of God. That is the ad intra, the internal operations of Father, Son and Spirit in which their personal characters can be discerned. Now we need to be reticent. Whatever said of these relations and of the properties of each divine person mustn't project an idea that God is some kind of society of essentially distinct persons bound by relationships into a, into a unity. God's unity is not the product of his imminent relations. Yet the indivisibility of substance of the one God allows us to affirm that God's personal works can nevertheless be seen as divisible, that is, allowing for real differentiation. Each of the triune persons could be identified in terms of what the scholastics called its hypostatic or personal character. That is, the properties which distinguish that person and so are incommunicable, that is, not shared by the other persons. Uh, Aquinas spoke of these personal properties as what he called notions, uh, which is um, a, a Latin term roughly equivalent to the Greek patristic notion of idioma, um, the particular characteristics of each triune person. And it's the, that usage, the term notion, which found its way into the later medieval and then, of course, into the Protestant scholastic tradition. 
We should bear in mind that the point of identifying these personal properties is not to suggest that the being of God is composed of three distinct centres of consciousness or action. For the triune God is indivisible. To speak of personal properties and actions is simply to indicate what each divine person is in relation to the other divine persons. In this way, therefore, the personal properties of each of the persons show not only the differentiation in the being of the one God, but also the kind of unity which God has, namely unity in distinction. Well, let's look at each of the persons from that uh, vantage point. God's perfect life is, first, the life of God the Father. Common Western Trinitarian theology, so much, of course, despised nowadays, common Western Trinitarian theology has it, that the Father is the principle, the principium of the Trinity. Principle, Aquinas says, in reference to the persons proceeding from him by fatherhood and common spiration. And so, because he is a principle without a principle, the Father is identified as his not being from another. The Father is characterised by, here's a technical term, inascibility, that is the property of not being begotten. Now this unbegottenness of the Father is importantly not simply a negative concept. It indicates what uh, Bonaventure calls in a lovely phrase, the Father's fullness as source. This also doesn't mean that as principle, the Father is in some way ontologically superior to Son and Spirit. All the triune persons are uh, possessed of a saity according to their common divine essence. But the Father alone is ingenerate, no other substance having been given to him. Fatherhood is predicated of the first person because of his eternal relation to the second and third persons. God, therefore, is Father not in isolation, but as the one who generates the Son and with the Son breathes the Spirit. Now, second, therefore, from the fatherhood of God as the principle of the Trinity come the two processions in God. That is, first of all, the generation of the Son, and then second, the spiration of the Holy Spirit. Begotten of the Father, the Son is the perfect counterpart of the Father. His passive generation, his filiation, his being generated, matches the Father's active generation. Similarly also, the Spirit's passive spiration, his proceeding from the Father and the Son, perfectly corresponds to the active spiration of Father and Son. What that means in this rather strange technical language is that paternity, God's relation uh, to, uh, son and, uh, to, to the Son uh, as Father, filiation, the Son's relationship back to the Father, and spiration, the Spirit's relation back to Father and Son, those relationships constitute the fullness of God. Being begotten and being breathed are relations of the divine essence. Begetting and breathing, of course, are not acts of creation. They don't affect a coming to be. They don't suggest precedence in time or superiority of nature. And nor are filiation and spiration to be thought of as sort of separate elements in a causal sequence in which Son and Spirit are brought into being. They don't denote lack because they're modes of God's eternal perfection. And so, therefore, Father, Son and Spirit are relative and reciprocal and mutually illuminating terms. Uh, together, they all define one another and constitute our understanding of the being of God. Well, that, in really brief summary, is the nuts and bolts of a Trinitarian account of uh, divine perfection. Augustine, you see, was right, wasn't he, when he said, nowhere is seeking more toilsome than where the Trinity is concerned. Well, where have we got to? Well, the argument so far has been that God's perfection is his particular self-existent majesty in the relations of his being as Father, Son and Spirit. A doctrine of the Trinity doesn't confine itself to observing differentiations within God's works in the economy. It considers their eternal ground in God's paternity and in the processions of filiation and spiration. 
And all this, I think, is nothing other than dogmatics trying to take seriously the first commandment. But let's go back to that earlier worry. Can that kind of theology of perfection support a theology of God's presence? Doesn't it close God from creatures in some kind of absolute repleteness in himself? This is Jensen again. He says, God is not personal in that he is triunely self-sufficient. He is personal in that he triunely opens himself. Well, my argument as a whole denies the antithesis which Jensen is proposing there. Self-sufficiency and self-opening are only mutually exclusive if we think that the gospel requires us to pit eternity against time and allow only the latter, time, to control our metaphysics. But the gospel does not so stipulate. To follow the instruction of Revelation is to come to see that the wholly realised, infinitely lively being of God in himself is the anchor of his loving, creative, redemptive and perfecting relations to creatures. This point, that we really require a doctrine of God's perfection in order to ground a doctrine of God's presence, this point, I think, can be filled out by two articles of Christian teaching. The first is that concerning the missions of the triune persons. Um, this is a common feature of uh, Western Trinitarian doctrine. Um, the second piece of doctrine is the so-called covenant of redemption, the pact of salvation, the pre-temporal pact between father and son to redeem creatures, a piece of doctrine which was developed by the federal divines in the Reformed tradition um, from the later 16th century onwards. Both of us, I think, enable us to see how God's imminent perfection is the root of his economic presence. And I want in the rest of the time, before we all finally keel over, to say a little bit about each of them. First of all, the divine missions. This is really exciting stuff, isn't it? Gosh. The divine missions are the movements of God's being in which he acts in relation to the creatures of his love. These movements are the Father's sending of the Son, the Son's being sent and coming to the world, and the Spirit's being sent to sanctify and perfect creatures. The missions repeat externally the internal relations of God's being. That's why sometimes in the tradition they're called temporal processions, but don't let's get hung up on that, we'll never get out of it. In considering them, in considering the missions, we remain crucially in the sphere of God's perfection. But we're looking at the movement of that perfection as it draws near to creatures. Each mission, each of the triune missions, is constituted by the divine person's eternal procession, that is, the particular divine person's orientation to its sender, the Son back to the Father, the Spirit back to the Father and the Son, and also it's constituted by that divine person's orientation to the one to whom the person is sent. Uh, that's usually called the term or destination of the mission. Now the order here is really important. That the mission has a term, that is that it's got a goal in the creaturely realm, already shows that God's perfection is not self-enclosed. God really does move out in love to creatures. But, again, the mission, the moving out, has no energy without the sending, that is, without the eternal procession upon which it rests. Hence the basic rule, which you can find in Thomas and elsewhere, missions follow processions. God's works repeat or externalise God's imminent being. This means, first of all, this is a kind of a crucial point for a lot of contemporary Trinitarian theology, Son and Spirit are not more themselves by virtue of their missions. The missions are already anticipated in the relations which constitute God's being. And so, in the realm of the missions, Son and Spirit are not, as it were, exposed to peril. They enact God's completeness. Second, however, processions can't be separated off from missions. The origin of Son and Spirit is not only, as it were, a whence, it's a whence which includes a whither. In the case of the Son, generation, his relation to the Father, can't be separated from sending. 
his coming uh, in the incarnation. In the case of the Holy Spirit, spiration and outpouring can't be detached from each other. God's perfection includes God's presence. Now, once we come to see this, then the relations of origin in the Trinity, so often, of course, castigated these days as the root of disorder in the Western doctrine of God, the relations of origin in the Trinity, in fact, turn out to be charged with limitless economic potency. Talking of God's original perfection in paternity, filiation and spiration, tries to apprehend the mystery of the Trinity which the drama of salvation sets forth to show the divine depth of the economy by articulating the conditions of its occurrence in the infinite recesses of God's very self. This is where the economy comes from, the doctrine says. This is its inexhaustible inner power. And so God's perfect life, precisely in its completeness, is the ground of creaturely well-being in fellowship with God. It's because of the divine processions that there are divine missions, that there is a creature, that there is a son to dwell with the creature and a spirit to unite the creature to the Father. Well, so much on missions. Next, the pact of salvation. Uh, Reformed federal theology, um, as it took shape at the end of the 16th century and onwards, expounded the history of God's redemptive presence as the orderly execution in time of a pre-temporal divine decree. The concept of the covenant of redemption offers decided resistance to thinking about salvation history just as a kind of temporal surface. And it does that by trying to show how God's works in time emerge from the anterior reality of God's will. Drastically oversimplified, the concept, I think, can be laid out in these terms. In order to carry out the eternal decree of God to glorify the elect, Father and Son conceive a pact. That is, they agree together to enact the covenant of grace. The Son covenants to be the guarantor or sponsor of God's covenant with creatures. That is, he undertakes to meet all creaturely obligations as the last Adam. This he accomplishes by keeping the law, by paying the penalty for sin, and so securing the redemption of the elect. The Father, in turn, covenants to empower the Son for and sustain him in his redeeming work, to glorify him at the completion of the work, to give him the elect as his reward, and to commit all power to him. Well, that's a crude summary, uh, and it may indeed seem as the kind of mythology which turns the history of redemption into a mere shadow. It can sound, in other words, as if uh, the pact concluded before the father and uh, uh, sorry, the, the pact concluded between father and son before time is such that nothing is at stake in incarnation, death and resurrection. In one sense, everything's been decided in advance. Yet it seems to me that if we ponder it a bit more, the covenant of redemption points to something indispensable for a theology of God's saving presence. Namely, that that presence is a function of and is secured by God's antecedent life. That it flows from the fathomless ocean of his abundance. The history of redemption, of course, doesn't take place in some other time than that of Adam's children living under the curse. But what kind of creaturely time is it? It is history which realises God's eternal purpose. It is history suspended from that purpose. And that purpose extends, that, and that purpose itself extends from the perfection of God's own life. We might say then that God's presence sets creaturely time under a divine conclusion deriving from his perfection. The economy of salvation is not the realm of the accidental, it is the realm of history under the faithful promise of God to himself and therefore to us. God's conclusion in the matter of redemption repeats the eminent relations of the Father who generates the Son and sends him into the world, the Son who is eternally generated and offers himself to enact the Father's will. There's no abstract divine will working behind the covenant of redemption, despite uh, Bart's worries on that score. 
because the pact between the Father and the Son repeats their eternal relations and personal properties. So the covenant of redemption is not, as Bart feared, a point at which some kind of amorphous deity takes shape. No, it derives from the antecedent identities of the triune persons and accords with the eternal order of God's own life. Moreover, and this again is crucial, the pact between father and son really does include creatures. Divine determination is not self-enclosed, it is open and intentional. God's will is not mere cause, but loving purpose, shaping creatures, perfecting them, bringing them to abundant life. God loves creatures by making a determination concerning them. And so the covenant which the perfect God makes with himself in the deep peace of eternity is a covenant to be with creatures. The inner divine pact and Emmanuel are indivisible. Once again, in the idiom of Reformed Federal Dogmatics, covenant of redemption and covenant of grace can't be separated because they're embraced under the single reality of the covenant of the gospel. The son with whom the father concludes his pact is indeed the last Adam, the firstborn and the head of his people. The perfect God is God with the elect. Is the fellowship between the perfect God with creatures a real relation? Well, Aquinas' denial runs thus. Since God is altogether outside the order of creatures, since they are ordered to him but not he to them, it's clear that being related to God is a reality in creatures, but being related to creatures is not a reality in God. Again, God's temporal relations to creatures are in him only because of our way of thinking of him, he says, but the opposite relations of creatures to him are realities in creatures. Now, what's going on here? I think what Aquinas is saying is this. Relation to God is real in the creature, but not in God, because a relation is real on both sides only when they share something in common. And the absolute difference between God and creatures means that the relation which is real on the side of the creature, because of the creature's dependence on God, is not real on the side of God, who does not so depend. There is a relation, but it's a non-mutual relation. Now, of course, within God's perfect being, there are, Aquinas wants to say, real relations. Processions in God are in the identical nature, and so they're real. Now, this seemingly abstruse bit of analysis actually picks out something really quite deep in the Gospel. God is in himself perfect relation. God does not wait upon creaturely response to enjoy completion. The relations, the covenant, the friendship between God and creatures are not reciprocal or reversible because they are gratuitous of his fullness we have all received. God, of course, is not indifferent. God laments Israel's infidelity and our own. The entire force of talk of the divine missions and the pact of salvation is to show that God's life is not a circle forever closed. But in God's relations to uh, what's outside himself, we see the asymmetry of uncreated fullness and creaturely need. An asymmetry which shows the freedom with which God loves creatures and comes to them. I need time. Um, in closing, three brief, more methodological remarks. In some so far, as Father, Son, and Spirit, the perfect God is and is present. He has life in himself, and he gives life. And if we put matters in those terms, it may help us see that the conceptual toil of Trinitarian theology does in fact bear fruit, that as Aquinas puts it, it helps us see our salvation rightly. Even in this kind of analytic mode, dogmatics is reason, service of the gospel, and the God of the gospel. Now, in the course of our exposition of these matters, we've been operating with three principles of Christian dogmatics, which I'd like to just make explicit uh, as I draw matters to a close. The principle of derivation, the principle of sequence, and the principle of inclusion. The principle of derivation says that the theme of Christian teaching is God 
and everything else by derivation from God. It's a material principle. It indicates the primacy of the doctrine of the imminent trinity for the entire corpus of Christian doctrine. And by extension, it's a principle which governs the way in which an account of Christian doctrine is to be ordered. Knowledge of the divine persons, their inner relations, and their eternal self-determination is necessary to illuminate the way the world is. The deity and personal differentiations of Son and Spirit, explicated in relation to the Father, form the bedrock of the existence, salvation, and glorification of creatures. Christian doctrine looks at human time and experience as an economy. That is, it says creaturely time and being are not simply something malleable, something to be pressed into shape by human will and action. No, they're formed by their creator and final end, which is the eternal God. Because Christian theology takes its rise in Revelation, it looks at the economy, as it were, from above, from the perspective afforded by what is given to us to know about the inner life of God's self-sufficient being from which all things derive. Now, theology, of course, doesn't do this because it's got secure purchase hold on the mystery of God. It does it simply because it stands in the sphere of an ever-fresh gift in the presence of God, the giver of knowledge. Only by virtue of that gift and that giver is theology able to speak of God's ways. In terms of the little medieval tag, it's only because theology is taught by God that it can teach God. But it is the task of theology to teach God, and to teach God as the absolute beginning, not the conclusion, of every train of thought. Indeed, it may be that recovery of this antique approach to theology's task, which is only superficially abstract from the situation of creatures, recovery of this task is the sine qua non of genuine theological renewal. The other principles are corollaries of the first principle of derivation. The principle of sequence says that in treating its double theme of God and everything else by derivation from God, both topics have to be treated and have to be treated in their proper order. In terms of our theme, the underlying material point is that God's perfection grounds God's presence and so can't be rightly considered without reference to his presence because to trace the perfection of God is to trace his internal works which turn to us in grace. Yet the material sequence is critically important because the second theme of Christian doctrine can only be grasped for what it is when it's seen as that. Second, derivative, in short, creaturely. If we reverse the sequence, if we derive teaching about God from human existence and history, we end up in a, in, in, uh, a doubly disruptive situation. We deform both the doctrine of God and what Christian theology has to say about creatures. Not a little of the history of modern theology could be read as suffering from the deformation, of course. Now, it's correct that there's no absolute requirement that the order of exposition in doctrine should follow the material order. It's quite possible to start an account of Christian doctrine at most points in the corpus. With teaching about the church, for example, with the theology of the Christian life, with providence, any number of examples. What matters is not so much the point at which you enter the corpus. What matters is, first of all, that you see that particular point in relation to the whole, that you trace particular articles of teaching back to their principle in God, and that articles of teaching retain their theological integrity and they're not filled out by resources other than those furnished by the gospel. That being said, there is a tactical decision to be made here, it seems to me. It's possible to begin from somewhere other than God's perfect life, but in a given set of circumstances, it may be imprudent and unprofitable to do so. That we find ourselves in such circumstances is a basic presupposition of what I've got to say in these lectures. The third principle, the principle of inclusion, states that ordering Christian teaching as a sequence from God's perfection to God's economic presence doesn't diminish the creaturely, but includes it as an integral theme of theology. Failure to move on to the second theme 
would lead to as drastic a deformation as failure to place God's perfection at the head of all things. Because God is who God is, there is a proper gospel humanism. But it can't be seized precipitately. We need to approach it slowly and patiently through the doctrine of God. Indeed, only when we approach it in this way do we attain to a real humanism, one in which being human means being a creature in the presence of the perfect God. But the fact that we may arrive at this stately affirmation of creaturely dignity is not the least of the gospel's glories. So derivation, sequence and inclusion, they are rules for the mind. They serve the apprehension of the gospel's God, who alone, as Jonathan Edwards says, is the all-encompassing being, he that is, and there is none else. In the rest of the lectures, we're going to turn to discuss how this one communicates himself by making himself present to the creatures whom he loves. Well, <laughs> um, many of us may have the feeling that we're relearning our theological ABCs, and uh, if theology is a conceptual expansion of scripture, some of us may have uh, encountered it along the way uh, that uh, you know, we get over the conception of the rut. For example, we go out to the broader Christian community, we might hear more about transcendent permanence than perfection and presence. I think we're trying to get a I, I do think the notion of life can do a great deal of, uh, of, of work in the doctrine of God. Um, I, I mean, I remember having a conversation um, a few years ago with Colin Gunton about, about this topic as to whether there was a leading theme in the gospel. Um, <coughs> and we kind of came to the conclusion that probably the best shot at that would be the concept of life because it embraced both um, the doctrine of God, who is God, he is the one who is supremely and infinitely alive, and it also shows that God, as the one who has that life in himself, is one who bestows life on others. And you could see the entire economy from creation through to the eschaton as essentially the preservation of life, or the gift and preservation of, of life. Um, the notion of perfection is is trying really to state that. Uh, I mean, I'm using it really because it's as, I think it's as neutral and as all-encompassing a term as I can get. The term transcendence, just, it's not big enough. Um, it, it essentially, it, I mean, as it, historically as it's expounded, it becomes essentially a paired concept. It, it becomes a concept which is defined in terms of certain kind of negatives. Um, it, it's not imminent, or a transcendent being is one who doesn't share certain kinds of creature limitations or whatever. Um, and it's also, it's probably since the 17th century, it tends to be tied into the whole process of um, what is the uh, causal agent of the cosmos life. In other words, it gets tied into the explication of how, how does it come about that there is a world. Well, I mean, that, it seems to me, is just too restricted. So I prefer the notion of divine perfection because it's, it's relatively neutral and therefore you can fill it out 
with as much material concept as we can. But you're right, I think, to say that a, f a fully um, material concept would have to be, um, well, it, I mean, it's, it's essentially it, it would have to be something where you're explicating um, not formal concepts, but, but, but who is God and how does God act, and the term life might be the best way of, um, of getting at that. I mean, I'm interested to know if other people have got better or uh, supplementary notions that, that could be poured into that. Um, well, you mentioned identity. So we have you know, the old yeah. term uh, being a person, or nature of person, and now we have identity and perception. And I said, just, you know, for yeah. the sake of we're trying to get a handle on yeah. how these concepts line yeah. up, and maybe they're incompatible, and we need to jump some concepts and keep the others. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, identity is all right. I mean, it's, it's doing a much more formal task, isn't it? I mean, it's basically saying this one of God. Um, um, and, and that's fine. Um, it's fine, certainly, as, um, uh, as a kind of resistance to um, comparative notions of God. What it doesn't do is tell you what this one, what's the content of, of, of this one. But, I mean, certainly the notion of identity needs to be uh, built in. Um, I'm not in any way averse to language about uh, being. Um, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the protest of Marion, etc., against the uh, use of um, uh, substance language seems to me just completely misplaced. Uh, I mean, it's a protest against um, something that nobody's really worried about, apart from um, people who are worried about it. <laughs> 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 um, uh, I mean, it, 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 it stems from an anxiety that... Um, misapply the language of being will turn God into an object. Um, well, yes, that's true, but I mean, you know, I mean, it doesn't take you more than four minutes thought to get yourself out of the idea that God is an object. Um, it actually becomes more of a problem if you've got Marion's kind of Eucharistic theology floating around in which you do tie God really very closely to uh, material objects. So you've got to have some kind of metaphysical scheme to get you out of the knock-on effects of that. Um, that's not, in a way, a problem that I find myself in, so I'm getting quite more cheerful about using language of being, I think. Uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of times, um, uh, I guess what one would call uh, the uh, declining fortunes of Western Trinitarian theology. Yep. Uh, I don't know if everyone here would necessarily know what, you, I, I think I know what you're talking well. about by that, but if you could elaborate on because you know, in all, all you right. talk about the Trinity, what exactly are you identifying there? Okay, um, I mean, I'm going to be a bit careful here. I don't know what you're kind of taught about the doctrine of the Trinity here, but the, there is a standard picture which uh, some people are told, which is there are two doctrines of the Trinity in the history of Christianity. There's a Western one, at which point everybody stands up and hisses. This was a piece of erroneous teaching invented by St. Augustine, who had a particular difficult psychological history. Um, in which God was essentially a big lump. Um, and he wasn't really Father, Son, and Spirit. He was a sort of a monad with um, three kind of external departments which all looked back to the central core. And there's another Doctrine of the Trinity, which is called the Cappadocian Doctrine of the Trinity, or the Eastern Doctrine of the Trinity, in which God is a warm and friendly set of relations between three people who get on really very well. Um, and have extensive relations to the creation. Now, the trouble about that is it's just not true historically. Um, and you can trawl through Augustine and find all sorts of things that people say the Cappadocians say, and the opposite, you can trawl through uh, the Eastern tradition and find also things that are there in the West. So the, the kind of distinction between East and West that has become um, a sort of historical device, just, it seems to me, is, is not really supportable. What I think people are often wanting to get at, people like Jensen, for instance, in Western Trinitarianism, is their fear that Western Trinitarian doctrine so emphasizes the pre-temporal, the, the sufficiency of God's eternal being, that what takes place in history, in God's, uh, God's interaction with time, that what takes place there is actually of no real significance. That in the end, because everything's already been determined in advance, that nothing's at stake. 
So when the Son becomes incarnate and goes to the cross, there is, th there is no real... Um, th there's nothing really happening. What you've got is, is, as it were, just the reading out of a script that's already been determined in advance. Now that, it seems to me, is... That, that's a bit of a tougher nut to crack than the kind of historical misrepresentation. It seems to me it depends upon a misunderstanding of what's meant by Augustine's uh, investment in pre-temporal eternity. That's not, it seems to me, a way of pulling back from time. It's more a way of saying, what is it that actually happens in time? What happens is um, the, 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 the outworking, the genuine outworking um, of that which God purposes for creaturely flourishing. So there is something at stake, but what's at stake is not whether God will be God. And that, it seems to me, is the point at which the kind of, for instance, Jensen's revision of Trinitarian theology, that, it seems to me, is a point at which he, you know, he kind of quite seriously at odds with the sort of thing that you find, not just in the Western tradition, but actually also in, in the, the, um, the standard Eastern tradition of Trinitarian theology. Does that, does that help? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it, I was wondering also if you're talking about the fact that uh, w with all the renaissance of Trinitarian theology, you might call it, in the last 20 years, I mean, a lot of people are writing ab about this Eastern idea. I mean, yeah. it's sort of the, it's sort of the trendy idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, so it's at the and part of, of the articulation of the trendy idea is problematizing the West. I mean, is, is that also? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the the, the line ha has often been. Um, we need to recover the economic trinity, and we need to, the kind of economic trinity that we need to recover is one in which there are real personal differentiations between the person, in which, therefore, there is a high-profile doctrine of the spirit, because the spirit is the one who perfects creation or something like that. Um, and it, it seems to me that, that it, it, it's, rec it's trying to recover a section of Trinitarian theology and often make it into the whole of Trinitarian theology, and there are losses if you do that. I mean, unless you have an operative doctrine of the imminent trinity, then at some point, you're going to go down the tube. As Jonathan Edwards would have said. <laughs> <laughs> Tom? Uh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this immensely. My question concerns the Pactum Salutis. And I'm thinking of Bart's, if I recall, Bart criticizes it not only as mythological, but also as polytheistic. He's worried that it has multiple centers of consciousness and will, and he rejects it. Um, it's been a while. Maybe I'm, maybe no, I'm not. No, you're yeah. doing right. He does yeah. that. It's a funny bit of Bart, I think, that his treatment for the Pactum Salutis. I mean, he's clearly irritated by it. Um, I'm not actually sure he really quite understood what was going on in it. Um, the bit, you're right, the bit that he worried about was, well, partly the mythology, but also his fear that you've got these two divine figures um, kind of striking a deal with one another. Um, and and he, he found that that was just... Um, it, it, it's as if the, this, there's, a, there's another drama going on way back behind uh, the revealed God that, that um, he thought was um, building on all sorts of... Um, you know, ideas about God which were, ju which were just not disciplined by the gospel. I guess I don't, I don't read it in quite that way. I mean, you can give a crude version of it, as, as Bart did, but I mean, any talk, for instance, of the son's obedience to the father is going to have to go through the same, go through the same issues. Uh, and Bart himself, when he talks about the son's obedience, talks in what sounds like pretty mythological kind of language, you know? I mean, he does talk in this in terms of fairly clear personal differentiations. Right. So, I in the end, it seems to me that, that Bart's objection doesn't really stand. Um, it, it's quite possible to give an account of the Pact of Salvation, which isn't um, about some crude bargaining between uh, Father and the Son, in exactly the same way that you can give a good account of penal substitution that doesn't involve God the Father saying, OK, pay the price and come back when you've done so. I mean... You see what I mean? He, he, it seems to me he was, he was over-pressing something, and that's partly, I think, because he, he's a bit irritated with, the, with, with some bits of federal theology in Volume 4, and he probably should take more time to... 
just ponder what these folks were doing before he, before he throws it away. I mean, is that your sense of what's um, going on? Well, that's, I, I, I'm more sympathetic to Barr. I mean, at least yeah. in the sense that he's consistent. Yeah. Um, I think. I mean, if you reject multiple centers of consciousness as the worst and worst sort of uh, polytheism out yeah. there, um, a tritheism worse than which cannot be conceived or yeah. something, then you probably should. Re it seems yeah, to me sure. you should you should reject yeah. any notion of agreement between persons or offer some sort of explanation of how it could be that two entities, two persons, have an agreement, even if it's not of the crude kind. They have some sort of agreement without being distinct centers of agent, uh, distinct centers of consciousness and will. I mean, if the father says I agree with you and the son says I agree, um, even if it's not in the crude sense, it still seems you have two divine eyes, to use Bart's phrase, um, and not just the one divine eye twice or thrice over. Yeah, it depends. I mean, you could do it in the way that you would do, for instance, talking about eternal generation, couldn't you? where you're not talking about, um, I mean, essentially what you've got, I mean, in order to get eternal generation right, you've got to expound the doctrine, then you've got to kind of strip it of, or you've got to surround it with all sorts of negatives, haven't you? So that we're not talking, for instance, about temporal derivation. Um, we're not talking about any kind of spatial dislocation or anything like that. Now, maybe that's part of what you need to do with the notion of the pact of salvation. You just need to keep making the negations in order to, sort of destabilize the mythology or to make sure that you don't fall into that kind of uh, mythology. Now, of course, it's Thanks. not the only... I mean, I, I wouldn't want to invest too much in the, in the pact of salvation because th th there are... I mean, there are other notions. The notion of, the, of missions, for instance, is... is well, it's got, certainly got deeper roots in the tradition um, and it's doing something of the same kind of job. But even when you see when you're talking about missions, divine missions, talking about sending and being sent does depend on some kind of differentiation. Um, I agree you need to be very careful about centers of will and consciousness. Um, but on the other hand, if you completely strip out that kind of language, then sending and being sent is a bit difficult, isn't it? So, uh, I mean, the, the clue, it seems to me, is kind of don't attempt a complete picture. Make the affirmations that need to be made but also surround it with the right kinds of correctives. And that's what Aquinas did. And basically, Aquinas is going to hope that at the end, the point would come across. Thanks. All right. Uh, you, you just mentioned um, the uh, obedience of the Son to the Father, yeah. and I, was, I wanted to ask you more about that and about mm. um, the eternal generation and, and this filiation relation. Yep. Um, to what extent do you see um, submission of the Son to the Father in the eternal relations? Um, and I, I know uh, Bart talks about the in the way of the Son of God into the far country. Um, he kind of tries to play, fill that out a bit, and I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, clearly you need to talk, uh, you need to talk submission language um, as part of your talk about obedience. But again, by submission, you can't mean, first of all, that the son encounters in the father a kind of alien will, um, as if the son is, as it were, being pressed to this, um, or as if um, the, the will of the father were kind of one of a range of options that the son had, and this was the one that pushed itself upon him with, with greatest force. Nor can obedience mean anything to do with, with ontological subordination. Uh, I mean, the tradition is just really strong on that, that whenever you talk about the son's generation, uh, you are talking within the, uh, the common being of God. Um, so the son's derivation from the father does not mean that there used to be father on his own, and then at some subsequent point there was father plus son. Uh, because th this, is, this is an uh, event, sort of event, or whatever you want to call it, within the eternal being of God, and not um, in any way a kind of subordination. I mean, and that's something really which, I mean, it emerges in origin, and then it comes out obviously very strongly in Athanasius as, as a basic plank in anti-Aryan polemic. By generation, we don't mean ontological 
uh, inferiority. Now, none of that <laughs> ends up denying that there is a genuine submission of the Son to the will of the Father. But his submission is a mode of his perfection. It's not a lack within him. Do you, do you see what I mean? Um, and, and that, it seems to me, profoundly in conflict with the kind of thing you find in the Gospel of John. I mean, the, the Son's uh, enactment of his mission in obedience to the Father is the way in which he is God. It's not the antithesis of his, of his divinity. Do you, do you need to come back on that? Or? And that's kind of what you're saying, and in, in you've you got to put some negatives out there so you show, because you yeah. th that could be perceived as uh, less than God to submit. That, that, um, that's right, yes. Yeah. So it, it's a matter of making sure that when you're using a term like submission, that you, you don't allow the term to dominate what you want to say about God. You allow what you need to say about God to dominate the term. And that means, therefore, ensuring that the, the theological use is, 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 always, uh, is always primary. Okay. I, mean, I mean, there are, of course, others who want to argue that it is possible to talk about a genuine ontological subordination within um, the Godhead. Um, sadly, they're called Arians. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're alive and kicking, I'm told. Probably not here, but... How important is it that the conceptual expansion demonstrate its moorings in the biblical witness? Well, I don't answer not very. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm curious. You, you I, I give think a very this is very important, Adam. I, I mean, I think, I think in a way the question is how, do, how does it demonstrate that? Is that? You gave a very high place to exegesis yeah. in your lecture last night. Yeah. So I find myself wondering, especially for my New Testament friends, but my, for myself as an aspiring theologian, yep. how much does that, that relationship have to be yep. demonstrated? Yeah, I, I think it does. Um, I mean, to some extent, I think the answer to that is, is going to be, uh, it's, it's going to depend to some extent on, on the context. I mean, uh, Aquinas, for instance, is often thought of as actually not being particularly exegetically explicit uh, in the summer. Uh, that's sometimes true and sometimes not true. But the reason that he can, if you want, get away with not being terribly explicit when he's not being very explicit is that he just presupposes an exegetical tradition. Plus also, Aquinas being Aquinas, when he wasn't busy writing the summer, was writing masses and masses and masses of biblical commentaries. You find the same also, it seems to me, in, for instance, in, in the um, Protestant scholastic uh, texts, wi which have roughly the same kind of relationship to scripture as you find in Aquinas. Uh, often it's quite explicit, or it's done through a kind of, um, kind of cumulative proof texting, which tends not to be uh, too involved in sequential exegesis. Now, our situation, it seems to me, is a bit different in that we can't, I mean, dogmatics can't draw upon um, an established tradition of um, theological exegesis, by and large. And so dogmatics generally tends to have to do its own, its own stuff. Um, now, in terms of how you actually go about, I mean, for instance, if you were to give exegetical demonstrations of this, you could do it, it seems to me, in one of two ways. You could either, well, no, one of three ways. First way is you would just need to make sure that the actual text that you were trying to write was just soaked with Scripture, that you had all, that the thing just echoed with Scripture, that all the illusions were there. Second, I think you would need to build in at the very least, some, some serious exegetical excursuses. You know, where you said, okay, let's go through a passage um, and let's show how this stuff works. But third, and I think, I think most important, dogmatics, I think, needs to go alongside the task of commentary. And, I mean, the task of, task of biblical commentary, at least until fairly recently, has really languished because commentaries have become repositories of historical information. Um.
commentaries in terms of 